All right, guys. It is 10 a.m. According to my iPad, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, if you all don't know, my dad's out of town speaking at, a, at an event down in South Texas, so I will be covering for him for the class today. Um, if you would, turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. So we're going to go through this chapter here. Uh, we'll see how far we get. I sound like my dad. We'll see how far we get. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll try to unpack what we can uh, for today until about 1035 or so. Um, and uh, we'll see what le- kind of lessons we can draw from this story. Um, so uh, just give a little bit of context for this chapter here. 2 Kings 5. Um, we're in the time of Elisha, the prophet Elisha. So it's after Elijah. Elijah had already been taken up um, into heaven by God. And now Elisha is now the prophet of Israel, if you will. Um, according to my limited research that I did, um, King Jehoram is now in power uh, in, in Israel. Um, so kind of give a kind of a, a historical context to, to where we're at uh, as far as the story is, is concerned. Uh, so if someone would like to read just first one, uh, that'd be great, and we'll kind of unpack it from there. Whoever would like to read verse 1, 2 Kings 5.1. 5, 1. 5, 1. Now, now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. Okay. The reason I had to stop at verse 1, because we have to unpack this verse a little bit. There's a lot of things in here that we need to... Uh, kind of uh, get in our heads as far as who this man is, Naaman, right? So what, what are some things that we know about him from just from this one verse? What do we see? Okay, he's a leper. Very good. Some second. Commander, right? So he's, he's a warrior. Okay. Say again. Yes. He's, he's in a very high position. So he, he is a man who has authority and is under authority, right? Very good. So he's obviously high up in the chain of command here. He's commander of the army, so he's a Syrian, right? What's to note about him being a Syrian? Or what should be known as, you know, what is he not? Let me put it that way. He's not an Israelite. Very good. He's not uh, of the children of Israel. That'll be very important as we, as we move through this chapter. So he's a Syrian, right? He's a warrior. Very, very good one, apparently. He's commander of the army. He's also a leper, Right? We are not told how severe his leprosy is, right? Everybody knows what leprosy is, right? Skin disease, turns your skin white, falls off, I said, I mean, more severe cases. Uh, we're not told how severe it is. Clearly, it's not too terribly severe. He's able to be, do his job well. Um, uh, we don't know. I mean, it could have just been mildly uncomfortable. Um, but he was, we're just told he is a leper, right? Mighty man of valor, so he's a very powerful, uh, good warrior here. Very good. So now we kind of have an understanding of who Naaman is, and we'll move on. Let's see. Who wants to read verses 2 through 4? 2 through 4. Go ahead. Now the Syrians had gone out in, in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel. And she, she waited on Naaman's wife. And she, she said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with, with the prophet who is in Samaria. That he, he would he would cure him of his leprosy, and Naaman <coughs> went in and, t- and told told his told his master saying, thus and thus spoke spoke the, the girl who who is from the land of Israel. Very good. So, um, what we understand from these verses is that Syria had gone out on what it says gone out on raids, right? So they've kind of think guerrilla warfare, right? Kind of little strikes here and there. And clearly they had taken back some captives and they took back a little girl from, from Israel. Could have been more than 11 or 12 probably. Um, so this girl has been made a slave, happens to be in Naaman's household, serving Naaman's wife. Right? But she says, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. So clearly this girl, little girl knows that, uh, as we learn, is Elisha uh, is a man of God and has the power to, to heal diseases, clearly. So, and Naaman gets, gets wind of this and says, and just repeats what the little girl said to his master, most likely the king himself, of king of Syria. And so, in verse 5, it says, Then the king of Syria said after Naaman uh, 
told him what the little girl said. Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. Right? Then the next uh, section in this verse. So Naaman departs and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. Okay, what, what is this? What do you think? Uh, why did he do this? Why did he take all this stuff? Exactly. He's thinking, i got to pay this guy. i got to pay the doctor, right? You go to the, to the doctor, you got to pay him sometime. Right, so he's, which is understandable, right? You, gotta, you know, you get something, you gotta, you gotta pay, you gotta give him something in return. So understandable. All right, verse six. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, "Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy." Okay, so there's this declaration being made um, to the king of Israel again, most likely uh, Jehoram, from from my research here. Verse 7, and it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So what's the king of Israel thinking now? Syria wants to fight, right? This is not just some, some uh, peaceful uh, uh, Approaching from, from this man is this is this is a war declaration is, is what the king what's what the king is thinking Who wants to read verse 8? Go ahead verse 8 Okay, so Elisha is the man with the common sense here Elisha is, is, is approaching the king saying, this is not a war declaration. Syria is not coming to, to, to make war with you. Because remember, Syria had gone out on raids, right? Up in verse 2 or so. Um, so the king of Israel is aware of this and is already on the edge of his seat, essentially. And, but Elisha is saying, no, that, that's not the case here. They're not trying to come to make war. This is, this is true. Um, uh, the king of Syria is sending this man, his servant Naaman, to, to be healed. Notice the last, verse, uh, last uh, sentence of verse 8. Elisha says, Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Okay, that will be a very important as we uh, move down into uh, the rest of the chapter here. So picking up in verse 9. So Naaman's on his way, right? He's on his way to Israel. Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Okay? Verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger to Naaman saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. In other words, your leprosy is going to be going to be gone. It's going to be healed. Verse 11, but Naaman became furious and went away in a rage. Right. Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God. And wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. So what was Naaman thinking here? What, what was Naaman expecting, I should say? Instant, Instant okay. So he was, he was thinking it's going to be, I mean, if this man is as powerful as he says he is, it's going to be pretty quick. Right? What else, what else can, we, can we learn from what Naaman had, had in his head, had, had in his mind? Nothing was expected. Right. He was just expecting to sit back and let, let the healing take place. Right? You don't necessarily expect him to do anything. What else? Anything? One more thing I'm thinking of. He expected God to do it. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, that may have been part of it, right. But what I'm thinking is that, what did he say? Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me. He was expecting Elisha himself. But what did Elisha do? He sent a messenger out. He said, you go tell Naaman to go wash in the Jordan seven times or whatever, right? Because remember, Naaman, Naaman's a man of power, right? He's, he's one to talk to the main man because he, he understands what that, he understands that relationship. So he's, he feels a little, you know, offended at this. He just sends a lowly messenger around instead of him actually at least coming out and talking to him face to face. No, he doesn't like that. Naaman does not like that at all. He went away furious, right? He will surely come out to me, stand and call in the name of the Lord, make some grand, grand kind of proclamation here, and then my leprosy will be, will be gone, right? But that's, that's not what happens. 
All right, he's going to wave his hand over the place, do all this you know, voodoo stuff, if you will. That's probably what he's thinking in his mind, and then it'll all be, it'll all be over. <laughs> You got ahead of me in my notes. Okay. Yeah, no, no, you're good. No, that's, exa- that, that's where we're going with it. That's exactly where we're going with it. It's, it's all about um, finding your place, especially in front of the Lord, right? And that's what we're going we're gonna to understand here. Elisha sent this messenger to say, go wash in the Jordan seven times. What does it say in verse 12? Because his name is still speaking. Who wants to read verse 12? Very good. So, for those of you who are not necessarily familiar with geographical history, I should say, um, the Jordan was a very dirty river. This was in the land of Israel, right? The Jordan River, it's, of course, mentioned throughout Scripture, but at least at this time, it's, it's not clean. It's just dirty, just kind of stagnant, just happens to be a body of water flowing. I mean, you wouldn't even let your, your cattle drink from them, much less yourself, or even, even get in it, right? It's just some dirty river. And Naaman's aware of this. And he says, are not the Abana and the Farpar, even in back in my home country, in Damascus, uh, in Syria, cleaner than this water? I don't want to dip in that dirty water. That's what he's thinking. I'm just going to get more sick, or my disease is just going to get worse. He's not understanding what's going on, right? Not yet. It's, it's understandable he has his reaction, right? Because he, he doesn't want to get dirty. He wants to get clean, right? So he turns and goes away in a rage. He's just, he's mad. He's furious. He, he's about to leave. He's probably about to declare war, <laughs> if anything. Um, but he, he's, he's just, just angry. But verse, thir- but verse 13 says, And his servants, this is Naaman's servants, came near and spoke to him, saying, My father or, or my, my master, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, just wash and be clean? Right? So here, in, the, in this part, in this section, his servants have the common sense, right? They're, they're thinking, and they're, they're going to tell him, you know, if, he, if he told you to go jump off your chariot when the horse is running full speed, would you have done it in order to be clean? I mean, that's just an extreme example, but they're saying this is, this is nothing compared to, to, to what he could have asked you to do, right? He's all, he, all he's asking you to do is go wash in this, in this river seven times. Just get in and get out seven times. That's, that's, that's pretty much it. So thankfully, Naaman understands that, verse 14. So Naaman went down, dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to this, this uh, saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. All right? Who wants to read verse, uh, let's see, 15. Very good. What does he say? Now I know. Right? Isn't that what Elisha said to the king? Verse 8. Please let him come to me. He shall know that there was a prophet in Israel. He knew there was a prophet, but now he knows. Right? Verse 15. Now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. He, He understood his own gods couldn't heal him of his leprosy. Only the one true God through Elisha the prophet. Right. So what are some takeaways we can take from this, at least from this section of Scripture here? Going through this, like we already mentioned humility, right? You've got to humble yourself before God, before uh, uh, understanding what, what you need to do in order to be saved. And we'll make application of that today. Um, so we have humility. What, what else? Faith. Faith, yes? But question, what can I right. If God says to do it, just do it. Okay, yeah, there we go. Good, yeah, it's not, it's not just a simple 
uh, act of belief that, that saves you, right? Here, Nemo was asked to, to go out and actively do something, to take hold of that free gift, if you will, putting it in today's terms, and then to uh, do something about go dip in this, this Jordan River seven times, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. So, God doesn't always work in the ways we think He should. Exactly. And sometimes our prayers reflect, okay, God, here's what I want you to do, here's how I want you to do it, yep. here's when I want you to do it. And it's not always about what we think. Exactly. And then, yeah, that's a great point. You know, today, nowadays, especially in America, which it's, it's such a country of convenience. You know, you have Starbucks just five minutes down the road, or, you know, you got gas two minutes down the road. It's pretty simple. Wi Fi is blazing fast. You know what I mean? Things, we get things very, very quickly here. And we don't necessarily feel like we have to wait for a whole lot. And when we have to, we get upset about it, right? It, it's, it's, and that's why patience is so heavily emphasized in scripture. It's about learning to wait, right? Wait on the Lord, right? And just be patient because God, God is a God of patience. He's a God of long suffering, right? He expects the same from us. That's a very good point. And, and you know what? Like, and like you also said, it's not going to happen probably in the way you expect. How many times have you expected something to happen uh, and asked God about it, and then it doesn't happen at least in that way, right? It's, it's, uh, it's humbling, if you will, you know? It's, uh, you think you know something, but then you realize you don't know anything, right? Uh, it's, it's humbling. It's very much humbling. So, Yes. I would say so. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if not just the symbolism of just having to go down to this water, um, you know, he's having to go bathe in this, this Jordan River. I can't imagine he just got his feet in there. You know, I'm getting pretty specific about the, the mode of baptism, but um, it's, it involves this water here. And obviously, the sermon writes itself at this point uh, about baptism, right? And we are called to obviously believe in and believe in what God says to do and like Elisha like Naaman did with Elisha says go down and dip in this Jordan seven times arise and be baptized right wash away your sins that's what happened uh, Naaman washed away his leprosy and we have spiritual leprosy if you will uh, we wash that away in the waters of baptism yeah, having our souls restored so very good yeah so we have uh, obedience uh, humility uh, what else can we learn maybe not necessarily from Naaman have we learned anything from, from anybody else? Well, I, I, I don't know about anyone else, but I was thinking about the fact that it this just proves that, uh, you know, Naaman was thinking along the lines of it's the water that heals me instead of it's God that heals me. And so I think there's also a point to be made that he chose the Jordan <laughs> instead of, you know, those rivers back home because he's like, I want you to know that it's not the river that's doing it, it's me, God, that's doing it. Because exactly. Right, yeah, that's a great point, yeah. I mean, it's, it's not about the quality of the water, how dirty or how clean it is. It's that God told him, God told him to do this through Elisha, right? So, yes. So I noticed the young girl's faith who sent him, her, her master, mm -hmm. sent him to go be healed. That he had enough faith that it would happen. Right, that's what I was trying to get at too as well, is this little girl. Again, I couldn't be more than 11 or 12 probably. She knew, she was taught by her parents or whoever, uh, even before she was probably taken away captive, and she remembered. There's a prophet in Israel that, that has the power to do this, obviously through the Lord. And so what does that say about people today, about little girls today, especially in the church? And we have several, right? Uh, I, I taught this passage, at least this first section in a class that I had covered for my mom when she was out. And I emphasize this point because Griffin and Sophia are in there. I said, you could be that little girl, right? I know all of us aren't little girls in here. Um, but you, you get the point, right? It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how, uh, what, what, uh, what uh, position you're in uh, job-wise. You could be a slave like her. You could be a, you know, doing grunt work, right? And you could still make an impact on, the, obviously, people higher up and just you know, people in general. 
because you s- decided to speak up and say something, right? And that uh, speaks volumes to the little girl's faith and courage in order to do this even uh, to, you know, her, her master directly. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, the, the, that childlike faith, if you will, not necessarily for just for the, her being a child, but just because the fact that you know it's true and that you accept it wholeheartedly because the Lord said it's true, right? Very good. So Naaman has a huge change of heart here. He, uh, he understands that it's not the water because if it was, he would go to these cleaner rivers, right? So it's not the water, but it's his, his humility that he's learned here, knowing that I'm not on top of the world here, especially in this country. I thought I was because I was coming here with all my people, my horses, my chariots, my riches, show off my riches in case I need to, you know, give a little to pay this guy. And he says, that doesn't mean anything, right? That is what he's understanding here now, right? In verse 15, indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel, okay? Uh, I'm not sure if anybody is familiar with this kind of uh, idea, but back in... Uh, especially in Old Testament times, um, the humanity in general kind of had a, a, the notion that gods were restricted to certain peoples, to certain kind of areas where they lived. So as we'll read uh, later in this chapter, like the Syrian god is mentioned here as Rimon, right? Uh, his master goes to the temple of Rimon later. Uh, various other ones. So their their idea is that uh, this, as, as listed as God, is the God of Israel. We have our God, Rimon, but Israel has their God, right? But now he understands that's not necessarily true. There is no God except for the one in Israel. And we'll see uh, how it fold, unfolds here. So in the end of verse 15, now he's expecting, hey, take some of my stuff, right? I brought this stuff. I'll give you all of it if you want, right? Because he's, he's clean, like it's, it's all gone, right? Verse 16, but he said... This is Elisha speaking. As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. But he urged him to take it, but he refused. So he's trying to push, like, hey, this is worth everything that I brought to be clean and be able to, to not necessarily maybe deal with the dread of knowing it might get worse or, you know, just being comfortable in general with, because of this leprosy. Naaman said, okay, t- take my stuff. But then verse 17, Naaman said, if not... Please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods, but to the Lord. Why did he ask for a bunch of dirt? Any ideas? Okay. This goes back to my, the, the, the notion that we presented earlier, that gods were kind of restricted to their peoples, Right? And then that land, so Syria had, I guess, Rimon, or, you know, probably others, but here is mentioned as Rimon later. He wants to take the land that God was, uh, of the people that God was over, the Israelites, and take it back to where he lived, because his whole life is there. He's, he's not about to just uproot everything, and he has a great job. He's commander. He's, you know, very well taken care of over here in Syria. So he wants to take... Uh, a bunch of dirt and make his own kind of, kind of uh, worship place, if you will. So we want to take this dirt and kind of lay it out in his, in his, in his land in order he, for him to worship God there. Now, obviously, today, we're under, we understand that you can worship God anywhere. Right? You don't have to take a certain uh, you know, emblem or land like, like Naaman is. Um, but he's, again, this notion is pretty widespread throughout uh, this, this ancient world here. So he's wanting to take dirt and make his own altar or a place of worship to, so he can worship uh, the one true God, which is uh, absolutely is, uh, a, fa- a fair assumption, right? He will no longer eat, offer burnt sacrifices to this God, but only to the Lord. But Naaman continues here in verse 18. Yet in this thing... May the Lord pardon your servant. When my master, the most likely king of Syria, goes into the temple of Rimon, this is the god that we mentioned earlier, 
goes into the temple of Rimon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the temple of Rimon. When I bow down, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this thing. So what Naaman is saying here is when he goes back to his country, Syria, his master is still going to be obviously worshiping this false god, this god named Rimon here. They have this temple set up uh, for this god Rimon. And so he's going to go down there, obviously, and bow before this, this god. Um, it's understood that uh, his master was older, uh, had a hard, kind of a hard time getting around. So that's why he says, that when his master leans on my hand. So what he's going to have to do is, as he goes into this temple, he's going to hold his, his master is going to kind of hold him on his arm to keep him steady so he doesn't fall over. And he's going to have to bow with, with his master to let him worship, right? That's the idea. So he's coming down with him so he can have kind of a support. That's the idea of going, bow, going and bowing down the temple of Ramon. He's trying to make it known to Elisha that I'm not going to be worshiping when I do that, right? I'm only helping my master not fall over and break something, right? That's the only reason I'm there is to help my master uh, get down and get back up again. Please pardon your servant in this thing. So Elisha says in verse 19, go in peace. So in other words, let it be done, right? So uh, it will be pardoned him. We've got 10 more minutes. We can get through the rest of the chapter. Very good. So we, we read of a new character in uh, verse 20, Gehazi, okay? The servant of Elisha, and the man of God. Uh, uh, servant of Elisha, the man of God. This may have been the one that actually went out and greeted Naaman originally. Well, we're not sure. Um, but he says here, uh, the rest of verse 20, Look, my master has spared Naaman, this Syrian, while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So the this, this servant Gehazi sees Elisha refuse anything that Naaman would have offered him. So Naaman's leaving, so Naaman's leaving with all of his stuff that he brought, right? Minus the leprosy. So he's bringing, he's taking back all of his, what did he say? Back up in uh, verse 5. Ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten shades of clothing. I mean, this was, this was a pretty good sum of money. Uh, you know, it was all worth, worth a lot. So Gehazi's getting a little greedy here. I'll run after him. I'm going to take something from him. So 21. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. So Naaman's on his way back. Here comes Gehazi behind him. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, it was all well? Gehazi responds with verse 22. Yeah, all is well. My master sent me saying, indeed, but just now, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Gehazi's expecting good payday here, right? So obviously geographically, Syria is pretty far away from Israel. So it's going to take them several days to get, to get around. So Gehazi thinks up this lie that, what does it say, two sons of the prophets have come. Did we read anything about two sons of the prophets? No. Not necessarily. It may have come, but as far as the text is concerned, we, we have no idea of this. So, obviously, Naaman knows nothing about this. He's probably a few days' journey uh, back, back, uh, back to Syria. So, around comes Gehazi, asking for this stuff. But what does Naaman do? Verse 23. Naaman said, please, take two. Take two talents. Right? So, he say, oh, yeah, no, I'll, I'll give you as much. I'll give you whatever you want. I'll give you double what you asked for. Right? Now, Gehazi's like, all right. I just got more than I was even expecting, right? So Gehazi's thinking, man, this is, this is a really good idea. A uh, stroke of genius by myself, if you will. Please take two talents, right? He urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing, two changes of garments, handed them to two of his servants, and they carried them on. So he's having his servants take them back with, uh, with Gehazi. So Gehazi's back, verse 24. He came to the citadel. He took them from their hand. And store them away in, in, in the house. So he's, he's put them away so Elisha didn't find out. Right? So he's, he's kind of hidden them. So he let, the, he let his servants go. So Naaman's now out of the picture. Right? Naaman's been healed. And he's taken his, he's taken his dirt and gone back home. Verse 25. Now he went in and stood before his master. That's Gehazi. Now Elisha said to him, Oh, well, where'd you go? Right? Elisha knew he left. He's probably gone for a few days. So Gehazi said, your servant did not go anywhere. Okay. 
lie. Verse 26, and he said to him, did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? In other words, was it really right of you to, to really go out and pursue this guy just for his money? Verse 27, therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And then Gehazi went out from, from Elisha's presence, leprous as white as snow. What were Gehazi's uh, big blunders in this section? Greed, okay. He, he saw what Naaman brought and said, I want some of that. It wasn't his. He was about to go get it by whatever means necessary. And that brings us to the next one. What was it? Deceit. Deceit, yeah, he lied. He, he not only lied to, to Naaman saying, these people came to Elisha's house and we need some money for him, but he also lied to his master himself saying, I didn't go anywhere, Right? Verse 25, where'd you go? I didn't go anywhere. I've been, I've been here the whole time, right? So it's, it's you know, double jeopardy for, for Gehazi at this point. And, I mean, if this is a poetic justice, I don't know what it is. In verse 27, the leprosy that was on Naaman, it'll be on you. Not only you, but your descendants, all you, your, your whole family, your kids, your grandkids, they'll all be lepers. Man, what a, what a horrible fate that is to just... Again, we don't know how serious it was, but obviously nobody really wants leprosy. That, that's the whole reason Naaman came to, to try and be healed from it. But, I mean, again, you know, we read in, in Jesus' day, you know, they always had to follow at least 10 feet or 10 steps back from everybody else because they didn't want to you know, pass on the disease, if you will. So they were looked on as they were kind of outsiders. As leper, you know, lepers, they don't, uh, they don't really necessarily have a place in society. They're just, they just, they just kind of happen to exist. And uh, they weren't treated the same, if you will. But that's, that's Gehazi. Uh, that's how the story ends here as far as in this chapter. Um, Gehazi now has name is leprosy. Uh, so we just have a few more minutes. Does that mean... Question. Yeah, go ahead. I would just think about you know, going back to where he, where he had the two mules of dirt, you know, and he took them back. Mm -hmm. And it made me think of a uh, uh, woman at the well when Jesus was talking. In, uh, in, verse, in John 4, verse 20, he said, Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Mm -hmm. Then on down, you know, it says, But an hour is coming, and now he is, when the true worshipers you worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Mm. So, no matter where you are. Right, yeah. But he, he just, he thought that that dirt, you know, he, he took that dirt back. He, yeah. He worshiped it. And again, I, I'm not going to question his sincerity, naming sincerity and trying to do what he thought to be right, which, I mean, obviously was to worship the one true God, but... Um, again, even in Jesus' time when he was at the, at the well there, um, you know, at, even in that time that Jerusalem was indeed the center of worship for the Jewish people. So that's, uh, you know, it was the designated spot to, to, to do your worship at. It was, it was in, in Jerusalem at that temple there. But Jesus is saying in that passage, it's kind of come a time, it doesn't matter where you are. Jer I mean, as we know, 70 AD, Jerusalem was destroyed. Um, but, um, even before that, saying it doesn't, it's not going to matter where you live, you know, where you decide to go. It's, it's, uh, you know, Worship if you, and that's right, you go where the people are, where the true servants of God are, and that's, that's where you can worship. I mean, obviously, even by yourself, but as far as a, a corporate context, is you know, it, it's, it's with the, it's with the people of God, right? And obviously, Jesus understood that, and, and was was uh, changing that up, if you will, uh, by his own authority, obviously. Very good. Uh, we got, what about? Do you know how far it was to travel? I'm not sure. Um, I'll have to look at a map. <laughs> um, but I do know that, I mean, obviously, they didn't have cars, no trains or anything. That They were well off. They had a horse, you know, a mule or something they could ride. But, you know, travel took days um, to, to get anywhere good. You know, so if, 
you know, it's not just a 10 minute trip down the road to visit your friend. It's, you gotta, you gotta prepare for this journey. So that's why, you know, Gehazi was thinking, I can make up this slide that his people came, because he's probably a few days out anyway, back to, back to Syria. So he's saying, oh yeah, people come. So he's gonna try and catch up to him and say, oh yeah, these people came here just a couple days ago, you know, just now they came. So we need some. That's, that's gonna be his, his basis for that. Yeah, yeah, he's gonna be slowing down with some dirt. But uh, very good. I appreciate your all's attention. Um, we, get, we didn't get through the chapter, so very, very good. Um, thank you all. We get ready for uh, worship. Thank you. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Thank you, Jim, for your uh, reading. I promised Jim I wouldn't have any big words, and hopefully I did all right by giving you that that simple passage to read. But if you would take your Bibles and and have them open to Matthew chapter 24, if you're not already there. Um, Matthew chapter 24, we're going to spend a good deal of our time there this morning. But to put everything into context, we have to first go back to uh, verse Three, when Jesus is talking with his disciples and in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3 it says now as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives the disciples came to him privately saying tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age Jesus had just finished discussing, uh, discussing uh, some complex things here and they want some clarification on it um, if you look at verse 1, he says that the temple will be torn down. It says no stone will be left on top of another stone. It's going to be completely destroyed. And the temple was a key part of their lives. And so they've got questions as to what's going to happen and what's going to go on with that. And then they ask, what would be the sign of Jesus returning in the end of the age? And Jesus goes on to answer these questions. But what I want to focus on this morning is how Jesus answered the question about his return, about what the sign would be or what the warning would be of his return. And he gives them that answer in verse 36 and following that Jim read for us. Let's read that one more time, Matthew chapter 24. Let's begin reading in verse 36. It says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will, be, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Now I want you to notice how the passage started off. Jesus comes right out and he tells them that he tells them what the sign will be. He says, There will be no sign. I'm not going to give you a warning. There's not an eclipse that's going to take place to let you know that Jesus is about to come back. Jesus says, I can't give you a heads up on when I'm going to return because I don't even know when I'm going to return. He said that is reserved for the Father only. The angels don't know, Jesus don't know, and man will not know until Jesus actually shows up. So if we hear someone in our day and time, we've all ran into to people, whether it be on social media or whether there's movies or books written where people claim to know when Jesus is returning. That answer, whatever they give, it's false. They don't know. Jesus says only the Father in heaven knows when he will return. But Jesus compares his return to a very specific Noah, and then he compares his return to uh, what I would call general or, or, or broad situations of men being out in the field and women being in the meal. Verse 38, it says, The people in Noah's day, it says, they were just living life. They were just eating drinking they were marrying they were given in marriage they were just going through their daily routines they were sitting on the porch drinking their coffee 
They were reading the book early in the morning. They were just doing their daily, normal routine, and then they were surprised. Verse 40, the meal, they were performing their daily task. They were going to work every day, working hard, doing what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, we could have a father and a son out plowing a field together. We could have a woman and her sister grinding at the meal together. And it says that one is going to be taken and the other is going to be left behind. We have people being taken, people being saved, other people being time but we have a certainty that it will take place but we have to ask ourselves what is the criteria what keeps one person um, being left behind and another person being taken let's go back to Genesis chapter 6 Jesus is the one that that tied into his um, second coming he tied it into the life of Noah so Genesis chapter 6, we have the account of Noah recorded for us. Let's see what separated Noah from the rest of the world. Genesis chapter 6, we'll begin uh, reading in verse 5 to tell us why people of the world would be left behind. That the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made routine, except their daily routine was wickedness. Everything that they did on a continual basis was wicked and evil and against the will of God. All the way to the point where he says in verse 7 that he is sorry that he made man. Think about that statement. You have done so much wicked in your life that God despises the day that He formed you and made you. Then we have in stark contrast, we have verses 8 and 9 when it starts talking about Noah. It says that Noah found grace in the eyes of nations. It says that Noah walked with God. Noah is completely opposite of the people. So with all the chaos going on in the world, all the evil Everything going on about. People shooting missiles at one another. Whatever was taking place in Noah's days, all the wickedness, it was impervious to him. He wasn't going to let those things impact what he was trying to accomplish for God. Noah needed to get busy. Noah's walking with God, but God goes on to tell him, Hey, Noah, you must start He says, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Verse 18, he says, I will establish my covenant with you. You shall go into the ark. He says, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you. So I want you to think about this. He tells him, he says, Noah, he says, I know you're walking with me. I know you're doing the right thing, but it's time to start making preparations. There's going to be a day coming that's going to be unexpected by everyone except for you who is going to be into the ark. So gather up your family when it's time. Go into the ark. And he says, and you will be saved. I like how the Hebrew writer says it in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. He says, by faith, Noah, it says, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Nobody knows this day's coming. But Noah was divinely warned by God. And it says in verse 7 that he moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household. It goes on to say the rest of the world is going to be condemned. But because Noah moved with godly fear and with faith and got busy and prepared that ark, he was able to save his household. God tells him, if you will be saved. Peter goes on to talk about uh, Noah as well in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20 and talks about how God was long-suffering in the days of Noah that he didn't just destroy everybody for being wicked. He gave them time to prepare. He gave Noah time and it says that he prepared that ark and because of that, eight souls were saved. And then he goes on to make uh, again to talk about uh, Noah in 2 Peter Chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, where he talks about the angels of old that sinned. He says that God, there's going to be a day of judgment for those angels. They've sinned. God's going to punish them. 
and they will be placed in chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And then he goes on to say, not only do I have that in mind for the angels, but also all those people in the days of Noah, all those people met that day of judgment when the waters came. And then he calls Peter, not only as someone that prepares an ark, but he also refers to Peter as a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. To sum up these verses, the day of the return of Jesus, it's going to be unknown. Just like in the days of Noah, nobody knows when the day of judgment will be. Some people will be left behind, but those that are like Noah will be taken. I want you to notice how Jesus further uh, elaborates on this point. Back to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The master of the house is responsible for the house. It's his house. He's got the responsibility. And if he knows the thief is coming, what does Jesus say? Well, he's going to be ready. If he knows the thief is coming, he's absolutely going to be ready. And he's going to make sure that the thief doesn't gain entry into his house. But the problem is, you don't know when the thief is coming. You don't know when to be ready. You don't know when to, uh, to, to be awake. You've got to be watchful. So time, just like that master of the house didn't know the time the thief was coming... We have a certain obligation. And that's really what I want to focus on this morning. That's what Jesus tells his followers to do if they don't want to be left behind to make sure, just like the master of the house, that they do three things. And let's look at these, these, these points that Jesus makes. Uh, he wants us to be watchful. He wants us to be protective. And he wants us to be ready. We are to conduct ourselves like the master of the house because we don't know the day watchful at all times. Since we don't know the hour when Jesus will return, we have to be watchful. Verse 43, Jesus said, But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. Jesus wants us to give attention to the situation at hand. That's what he expects of us. We have to be awake. We can't be asleep at the wheel when we're going through our daily activities. We have to be awake and watchful. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, we have Jesus. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's there. Zebedee, which we know are James and John. And we know that he's about to be betrayed. He's very distressed at the moment. He knows what's about to take place just in a few hours. That Judas is going to betray him. He's going to be hauled away. He's going to be hit, he's going to be spat upon, he's going to be sacrificed. All these shameful things are about to take place. And in verse 38, he tells his disciples, he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. He says, even to death. He tells them, stay here and watch. With and he tells his disciples, you've got to be watchful. You've got to be attentive. You don't know what's around the corner. And he wanted his disciples to have, to have the same mindset that he had. Look at verse 40. It says, then he came back to the disciples and he found them what? It says he found them sleeping. Exactly opposite of what he had told them to do. He found them sleeping and he says to Peter, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How can Peter... James and John be so unaware of the situation at hand. They're there sleeping. Jesus had already warned them. He had already told them, make sure you're alive. Make sure you're alert. You've got your eyes open. You're ready to go. And they didn't have a clue. Can you imagine Noah in his day and time not being watchful or not being aware of his surroundings and how quickly he would have been swallowed up with the rest of the world? if he didn't have a watchful eye on what was taking place. Pray so that you don't enter into temptation. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, Paul is telling the Corinthian Christians, he's writing to them at the end of this letter, and he tells them in very simple terms in verse 13, he says, watch. He says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. There's a whole lot of information right there, a whole lot of things. Be attentive. Make sure you understand your surroundings and what's going on with the times. Stand firm in the faith. The faith that the apostles have delivered to you, it doesn't do you any good to be firm in the faith and be courageous and have all these other attributes if you're not watching what's going on. You don't want to be taken by surprise. Peter gives us a, a further understanding of the concept in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, when he says, Be sober, keep your mind clear, be sober, be vigilant. That word vigilant. He tells them, be sober, be vigilant. And he says, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We've got to be on guard at all times. If we're not watchful, the thief comes into our house. If we're not watchful, the lion is right behind us, ready to devour us, ready to take us over. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for three days, two days, or 30 years. We've got to be watchful and we've got to be mindful of what's going on. The return of Jesus, it will be unannounced. There will be no warnings. So daily, we must be watchful. Daily, we must be attentive in our lives so that we won't be... This will return. We must be protective at all times. We cannot allow certain things to take place. In Matthew chapter 20. 4 verse 43, he said, Know this, that if the master of the house had known the hour the thief would come, he would have watched, and he says, not allowed his house to be broken into. A good master of his house is going to be watchful, but he's not going to allow certain things for what goes on in the world around us. We just can't. It's a fact. There's only certain things in this world that we can control. We can control what comes into our house, we can control what comes into our minds and how we act and how we respond to certain situations. Even Noah, as righteous as he was, couldn't control all the wickedness that went around him. He could only do what he knew to be right and leave the rest up to God. The world was wicked, but Noah stayed faithful. He found a way to what I would call restrain the environment around him and not allow that environment to influence what he was. Pretty good example here. In Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 40 and 41, Jesus is going around and he is teaching and preaching and uh, he is healing people. And in Luke chapter 4 and verse 40, it says, when the sun was setting, it says, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases, they brought them to Jesus and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. In verse 41, it says, And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. And he, it says, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. If he knew what time the thief was coming, it says that Jesus did not allow these demons to speak. He restrained the demons. Yeah, he didn't allow them to confess to everyone that he is the Son of God. Jesus could have destroyed or annihilated the demons, but Jesus just eliminated the influence, if that makes sense. He did not allow the demons to have any more influence on that specific situation. It's the same thing uh, that, that we have to worry about. We don't need to allow people to influence. Watch for Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 Paul says, he talks about not giving place to the devil. What happens when you give place to something? When you give the devil a seat at the table, so to speak, what's going to happen? Well, he's going to have his field. He's never going to leave. He's going to stay there for as long as he wants to stay there. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 12, he says, Do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. He goes on in Romans chapter 6 in that context to warn about being a slave to sin. Don't allow sin to come in 
and exercise influence or control over you. The master of the house must be watchful. He must protect his house, control what he can control. And if the master of the house knew when the thief, thief was coming, he would protect his house and not let him in. We don't know the hour of Jesus' return. So we must always be on guard. We must always protect our salvation each and every day. Point number three, we need to always be ready. Always be ready. Since we don't know the hour when Jesus will return, we must be ready at all times. You also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Noah gives us a great example of how to prepare. As the world was continually evil, Noah was walking with God and he was preparing for that day. Every day he built that ark. He was faithful and he was preparing for the day of judgment. I want you to turn to Nehemiah chapter 4. We have a, a great account here of the Jewish people in Nehemiah chapter 4 of, of how they prepared. Uh, Nehemiah, he was given permission from King Artaxerxes to go back to Jerusalem. They were taken away into captivity. He allows them to go back uh, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And if you'll remember, they were being attacked. They're trying to get these walls built, but all their enemies keep attacking them, to attacking them while they're trying to rebuild the wall that's supposed to protect them. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 15, or sorry, uh, verse 16, it says, So it was from that time that half of my servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Verse 17, it says, Those who built on the wall and those who and with the other held a weapon. Every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. Skip down to verse 23. It says, So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. What was their main objective? Their main objective was to build the wall. That's what they were there for, to start rebuilding Jerusalem so, they, so that they could inhabit that city. That's much more than just their main objective. They had to be prepared to do things that they weren't really comfortable doing, things that weren't very pleasant. It wasn't ideal to rebuild a wall with a hammer in one hand and a spear in another. It wasn't ideal for them as the children of God to work on that wall and lift bricks and rocks with a sword on their side. None of that was ideal. Nobody wanted to, to go to bed that night with dirty, stinky, nasty clothes from working all day, but they didn't have time to wash their clothes every day. They were going to be attacked. They had to be ready and prepared at all times. As Christians, just knowing your Bible and being able to talk about your Bible is not your only uh, method of preparations. Sometimes that's all we think. Well, as long as I know my Bible, as long as I do what, what, what Peter said and first defend the gospel or tell somebody about Christ, well, that's not all we're supposed to do. That's a big part of it. That's a huge chunk of it. But there's other things that we have to be prepared to do as well. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11 talks about all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer, what does it say? Persecution. We've got to be prepared mentally and physically to suffer persecution. Just knowing your Bible is not enough. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, it says that we discernment. Luke chapter 12, verses 51 through 53 says, Hey, I know you may know your Bible, and but guess what? Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace. He says, but I came to bring division. He says, there's going to be a father against his son and a mother against her daughter-in-law because that's what Christianity is going to do. It's going to cause division, even amongst your family. And the question is, are we as Christians, are we prepared for these things? We've got to be prepared for all aspects of Christianity. And we 
And, and it makes us prepared for the day when Jesus will return. When Jesus comes back, we must be prepared. We must be ready. Jesus says we are to conduct ourselves like the master of the house who knows a thief is coming at an unknown time. And if you don't know the time, then always you have to be watchful. You always have to be protective. You always have to be ready. One last passage and the lesson is yours. John chapter 14. Jesus is speaking to Thomas. And he tells Thomas in John chapter 14 verse 1. He said, let not father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, he says, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also two things we get from this passage number one Jesus will return it's a, it's it's a certainty he says I will return I'm gonna take some and I'm gonna leave others in the heaven is always in a state of readiness just like we should be in a state of readiness for Christ's return. As Jesus keeps heaven prepared for you, are you preparing for heaven? That's the question this morning. Each and every one of us has to ask that of ourselves. Are we ready because the day is unknown? We offer an invitation at the end of each lesson. It's an opportunity for you to come forward and ask for prayers or encouragement of the congregation. Whatever your need may be, won't you come forward as together we stand and we sing.